Very good. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's meeting of the Southernizing Criminology Discussion Group. It's been nearly two months since our last seminar, and today's our pleasure to welcome Dr. Anna Gudinskaya. Anna will talk about Russian criminology, and this will start another series of seminars on the state and the development of criminology in different regions. As some of you may know, late on this time, we'll have some seminars on criminology in the Anglophone Caribbean, in the Arab world, in indigenous contexts, uh, and in East Asia. You can all sign up for these events on our uh, website. And Anna, we all know this is a very delicate context, so I just wanted to thank you again for accepting our invitation and making it today. Uh, Carla will briefly introduce our speaker now. Thank you very much, Louise. Um, well, Anna Gurinskaya holds a joint appointment as an associate professor uh, at the Department of Liberal Arts and Sciences at St. Petersburg State University, as well as a professor uh, at the Department of Law, Herzen State Pedagogical University of Russia in St. Petersburg. Her research centers on crime prevention, private security, police legitimacy and procedural justice, digital technologies and crime control. More recently, her projects include a study of sexual harassment in the academic setting and compliance with COVID-19 regulations. Her research has appeared in the Annals of American Academy of Political and Social Science, the Journal of Crime and Justice, the International Journal of Comparative and Applied Criminal Justice, and the Journal of Contemporary Criminal Justice, among others. So we thank Anna for being here with us today. Um, just a, a minimal reminder of our housekeeping rules. Um, the talk will last uh, for about 30 to 40 minutes. After that, we will have time for questions and answers, but we will be stopping the recording before that. Um, so without any further ado, please, Dr. Grinskaya, thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, hello everyone. And I would like to thank University of Oxford and the Southernizing Criminology Discussion Group for inviting me and having me in those um, difficult times. And it's a great pleasure for me to be able to be here at this meeting and share some thoughts about the development of uh, Russian criminology. And I'm also looking forward uh, to the questions that you may have after my presentation. So I will um, start my presentation with a quote. Uh, this is a quote that I, uh, all of a sudden I discovered I was teaching my students about um, feminism and criminology and I was just um, uh, skimming the book uh, on international perspectives in feminist criminology and I came across um, the article by Monika Platek who is a well-known Polish uh, criminologist. And so she was saying that uh, Poland had uh, ideological non-scientific criminology at the universities. And she was uh, talking about the 70s and 80s. So it was flunky, trashy, ministerial criminology and genuine open research being conducted at the Academy of Sciences in Poland. And to uh, Polish uh, criminologists, American criminology had a sense of freedom. So it was real science, contrary to anything that could possibly come from Russia. I wanted to be as close to the truth as possible and as far as possible from Russia. It took me some time to realize that American realities are not much more relevant than Russian realities to Polish conditions. So um, when I was thinking about this quote and I was uh, trying to think how it may help me to structure my presentation, I was thinking that maybe uh, given this quote, uh, what I should uh, talk about is what is the real nature of contemporary criminology in Russia? Is it as Polish criminology that definitely was influenced by the Russian criminology in the 70s and 80s, whether Russian uh, science is still ideological and flunky, like Monika Platek is describing Polish criminology, or has it changed since then? Has it become genuine criminology? And again, what do we really call a genuine criminology and how can we distinguish genuine from non-genuine research? And the second thing, that I was thinking more in the context of the um, a name of this discussion group, Southernizing Criminology Discussion Group. So the question is, since Russia once was kind of like an academic empire 
influencing a lot of countries that were under the umbrella of the Soviet influence. So how is Russian criminology and maybe more general Russian social sciences, how do they feel themselves right now? How are they really different from the Western or Southernizing criminology or are they really Asian or Southern? And I will get back to these questions maybe towards the end of my presentation. And again, when we will have maybe a Q&A session, maybe we can talk a little bit more about it and maybe you could share some ideas about it. But uh, first I will, um, I suggest to look at the history of the Russian criminology. It emerged um, fairly early in the early 1800s there were some first um, uh, initial works that were pointing to the necessity of gathering statistics about crime. One of the first criminologists was Alexander Radishev, who published not only his famous seminal work about the trip from um, St. Petersburg to Moscow, but he also published uh, a very important work for the Russian criminologists about um, legislation. And also there he had some research agenda. He was suggesting, uh, let's say to compare crime rates in Russia before uh, the capital punishment was abolished in the 18th century and after it was brought back. So he was really uh, suggesting ideas about how we should gather data about crime and how we should analyze it. And in the 19th century, criminology was a fairly promising field and the field that was developing uh, very rapidly and in line with the European developments. And the positivist ideas were dominating the field by the end of the 19th century. There was a lot of attention to biological theories um, and also uh, anthropological, psychological theories that were emerging in the European countries. And there was an ongoing debate between Russian criminologists and the European criminologists. They would argue with each other, they would share ideas. So it looked like uh, Russian criminology at that point was fairly well integrated with the uh, European uh, part of the world. And in the beginning of the 20th century, several centers were established that were meant to deal specifically with crime, to study crime. In 1918, there were regional centers in several regions of Russia, including uh, St. Petersburg, Moscow, and uh, Saratov, and several other regions. And also in 1925, the State Institute for the Study of Crime and Criminal was established in Moscow, and actually it survived pretty much through the uh, Soviet times, although with a different name. But, um, and, and now even now probably you can see um, certain units that were left from that um, state institute, but now they are more under the auspices of the Ministry of the Interior. Um, but in 1933, uh, all theoretical study of crime was labeled as ideologically wrong because criminologists until then were still looking at the sociological and biological theories of crime. And according to the Marxian ideology, crime was supposed not to exist in the Soviet Union because Soviet Union allegedly had um, conquered the capitalist mode of uh, production and under the socialism and the soon developing communism, there are no root causes of crime, so crime is not supposed to be there. Uh, so from 1933 until early 60s, criminology did not exist in the Soviet Union. Well, it would be wrong to say that it did not exist at all. There were some publications but they were more of a historical nature. For instance, there was a five volume um, book by um, Girnet who published about Russian and early Soviet prisons, but again, more from a historical perspective. But in 1961, the Soviet state saw the need in criminology because crime surprisingly did not go away. There was something to study and even uh, by the 1960s, crime was growing and also it coincided with the general urge of the Soviet government to understand more about the society. So it was the time when sociology was kind of slowly being brought back 
into the curriculum of the universities. And by 1964, new, new university courses in criminology appeared at um, uh, Soviet universities. And since then, we can talk about the um, continued tradition in the development of the Soviet and then Russian criminology. Uh, so as I've already mentioned, the Soviet criminology relied mostly on the ideas that capitalist exploitation is the root cause of crime under capitalism. And um, of course, then the question remained, why do we still have crime when we do not have capitalism anymore? So why does crime exist under the socialist conditions? And the most important theories were the theories of the like residuals of the past, like the theories of the birthmarks of capitalism. So people uh, who still live in the conditions that uh, bear those birthmarks, they absorb in their individual, individual consciousness those individualistic traditions, individual, individualistic worldview interests and motivations. And as soon as we will be able to get rid of those birthmarks, we will um, be able to put an end to the to crime. Also, another thing which kind of prevents the Soviet Union to get rid of those birthmarks is, of course, the imperialist surrounding of the Soviet Union that does everything in order to stop Soviet Union from uh, prosperity and, uh, and tries to disrupt economic and social relations in the Soviet Union. So we can attribute crime to the influence of this imperialist surrounding that through its propaganda that does not have too many chances to reach uh, people in the Soviet Union still manages to get it outlets to influence them individual consciousness. But still um, in every criminology textbook of the Soviet times, you would see this idea that crime is destined to disappear. So it's a historically transient phenomenon. It doesn't have any root causes uh, in uh, communism and Therefore, um, currently, yes, we are experiencing maybe even like the uh, raising crime rates. However, once the country gets to the um, communism, and nobody knows when this will happen, but in the late Soviet Union, as maybe some of you uh, may remember, the slogans were that the, this generation will live under communism. So it is kind of a future which is maybe not coming in the next two, three years, but fairly soon we will um, live under the communist conditions. Um, so at the macro level explanations of crime, other than, I mean, you can't only rely on the birthmarks theory, you still need to kind of develop something uh, more important. And so um, macro level theory developed and it was grounded in the, in the only allowed um, ideologically allowed approach of dialectical materialism with the fundamental laws. And the most important for criminology out of these three fundamental laws was the second law, the law of unity and struggle of opposites. That all uh, processes that are happening in the society or in any even natural phenomena, including crime, which is a societal phenomenon, all these processes are driven by the contradictory, mutually exclusive, uh, opposite tendencies, or they call them contradictions. And so under capitalism, these contradictions also exist, but the only way to resolve those contradictions under capitalism is the revolution. And the revolution had already happened in Russia, therefore we don't need a revolution any longer to resolve contradiction, but we still do have some uh, contradictions in the way how the country is being governed. There are contradictions between people who live in the rural areas and the urban areas. There are contradictions between people who uh, work at, at the factories and who do the uh, efforts like the bu bu bureaucratic efforts in the government. So in that sense, there are still some oppositions that need to be resolved in order to uh, deal with crime. And also there was an interesting idea that stems from the second uh, law of dialectical materialism that criminality as a social phenomenon, it has um, this tendency to self-determine itself. So the contradictions that exist 
within criminality will um, kind of keep um, criminality develop, developing. So crime produces itself. Um, but Soviet criminologists were arguing that those uh, contradi uh, contradictions are possible to overcome. So what you need, you need good governance. You need to plan well. It is a planned economy. So like this, in the same way how you are um, planning uh, your economic efforts in the same way you should be planning your uh, crime control efforts. On the micro level explanations, there were um, some other theories. For instance, I've listed here the theories that were um, mostly um, popular, I would say. And um, when I'm giving those uh, titles like rational choice theory or situational theory, it doesn't mean that those theories were adopted from the West. Uh, it only means that, let's say, rational choice ideas were based in the idea of the free will and people being able to choose between committing crime and not committing a crime. It was not really a very well developed theory, but at least you can trace some um, free will uh, ideas there. So it's not only just the uh, determinism and actually, um, it was very difficult to be like a positivistic determinist in the Soviet Union. And one of the reason, uh, one of the reasons why uh, Soviet criminology ceased to exist in the 30s was that criminologists were accused of exactly being positivists. So it was like a curse word. And so if you're not a positivist, maybe you should look at the free will ideas that, so the free will is kind of driving you. If there are no drivers, like those capitalist drivers, the mode of the production is not driving people into crime, then it must be something else. And therefore I believe that those rational choice ideas emerged. And also you know, criminologists thought about how the immediate situation that um, precedes crime, how does it make people more crime prone uh, and how people subjectively and objectively kind of perceive those situations. I mean, how the situation objectively influences them versus how they subjectively perceive particular situations as being uh, crime prone. So in some ways, this may be similar to routine activities theory, but again, not exactly. Also, there was a theory uh, which would be somewhat similar to the differential association theory, the idea of criminal predispositions. And if you look at the contemporary uh, Russian criminology, you will definitely see some traces, well, maybe not some traces, but many traces of this particular theory that pe some people are just more uh, predisposed towards crime because they do engage more with um, people and situations who share pro-criminal values and also kind of the idea of legal cynicism and being exposed to the to those like cynical ideas about the world, sharing the cynical worldview, how it pushes people on to the criminal pathways. Also, there were some ideas about people liking self-control. But uh, see, it's very difficult to tell whether those ideas were developed originally by the Russian criminologists in parallel with what was happening in the West when those similar uh, traditions emerged there. Or um, maybe some criminologists were to some extent familiar with some scholarship that was coming from the West because if you read some memoirs of the sociologists, the sociologists clearly were aware of what is happening in the Western sociology. And they were um, citing and borrowing ideas from the Western scholarship. When it comes to the um, Soviet criminology, I would not be uh, so sure about the um, deep awareness there was one a book published in the late 1960s that had some translations from probably some, uh, some American handbook, criminological handbook. Uh, but those were not those rational choice ideas, but rather some works by Merton, Cloward and Olin, and some Chicago school ideas. 
so again, it is very difficult to say whether it was just a parallel development of the similar uh, kind or it was some borrowing from the West without really acknowledging that it was borrowed. Um, again, I don't have any evidence um, for neither of those um, um, ideas. And also there was some growth of empirical studies. There were some research institutes that were developing research agendas to study different kinds of crimes. Again, now we can't say that it was really well developed because the access to social science research methodology was very limited. There were no um, books on methods that were translated. And again, given the lack of development in sociology and non-existence of political science or any other social sciences, it was not that easy to invent this uh, methodology for empirical research. But Soviet criminology had very strong policy impact. And Soviet criminologists argued that criminology is a science of crime prevention. So preventing crime was seen as the main goal the main agenda of the um, uh, Soviet criminology. And people were thinking not just about uh, criminalization, but also about how to um, stop crime before it happens, how to influence the administrative legislation, those how to, what to include in the administrative offenses and how to police administrative offenses in order for this not to grow into something more um, socially dangerous. And also the idea so that we need to calculate the risks. We need to classify the offenders based on the degree of their social dangerousness. That was a very important idea. And it was reflected in the uh, criminal legislation, in uh, penal legislation. So all uh, criminals, they were uh, classified in a particular way, according to the type of crime, according to the uh, personality of the offender. And there was a lot of research about the personality of the offender and how the knowledge about the personality of the offender helps us to better classify them so that we put them in different prison facilities so that they kind of, they don't mix with one another and um, that they um, do not influence each other, so the most socially dangerous should be kept away from them, less socially dangerous. And uh, the prevention measures ranged from very general measures uh, that um, dealt with like um, education, with um, fighting with, um, well, I wouldn't say poverty, it's difficult to talk about poverty, particularly in the 60s and 70s, uh, there was definitely more equality than it is now. But generally, those measures were aimed at improving social conditions. And also specific treatment programs were developed, particularly for high-risk offenders, programs in prisons, programs outside of prisons. And as I've mentioned, under the planned economy, everything was planned in the hand. So you had to first make some scientific predictions. And actually this like science of predicting crime was very popular. There were research institutes who were engaged in predicting in kind of modeling in a fairly simple way, but still modeling crime, making, giving those like pessimistic, optimistic scenarios about crime. All this information, however, was classified the criminologists, just ordinary criminologists, but particularly the ones who were working not in the law enforcement institutions, um, because there were uh, research institutions and the academic institutions under the auspices of the law enforcement agencies. And this is still the case. So we have like a law institute of the general prosecutor's office. We have the law institute of the ministry of the interior and so on. Uh, investigative committee has its own uh, university. So it was the same thing in the Soviet times. But even people who worked there, they did not have the full information about crime. All the statistics was um, classified. And um, crime prevention policies were implemented by a wide range of actors, not just the state, but also non-state actors, including citizens were involved into the implementation of the 
uh, policy programs. And of course, party, the Communist Party, played a very strong role as one of those crime prevention actors. All those party meetings where people, they were summoned there. And if somebody demonstrated some signs of becoming a um, socially dangerous person, immediately the party would react in a particular way. Uh, so what happened in the 1990s after the breakdown of the uh, Soviet Union? Well, I would say that a peripheral revolution happened. So criminology had um, redesigned its theoretical grounds to some extent, but only at the peripheral centers, not in, the, not in Moscow, not in the central institutions that were working with the uh, crime agenda. And uh, new approaches emerged uh, in the Russian periphery. So there were some alternative views about what is criminality, how we should define crime and criminality, and how the structure of the discipline should look like. So um, those new ideas were the ideas that cr criminality is no longer this uh, historically transient phenomenon, but this is a phenomenon which is um, kind of its normal and natural kind of innate uh, characteristic of the society. Professor Shostakov was arguing that this is the case and he established what he called the Volga Niva school of criminology that, that is still exists and um, they still um, work with this idea of a criminality and also some social interactionism, constructivist ideas came in Russia and Professor Gilinski is one of the main proponents of these ideas. He looks at crime as a social construct and uh, promotes this idea everywhere at every public forum, criminological forum that uh, he visits. And interestingly, 30 years after all of this looks as if it's uh, like a very fresh and new idea. Uh, and in terms of the structure of the discipline, um, people in St. Petersburg, people in Saratov, which was another big regional center for the development of criminology, they were arguing that criminology should engage with uh, analyzing political crime, political repressions, kind of what the Soviet state was doing to its citizens. So this should be a part of the criminological scholarship as well. And also Shostakov argued that there should be new branches in criminology because uh, criminality as a social system interacts with such social systems as politics, as family, as economics, as whatever else like mass media. And so the systems in the interaction of the systems, you can find those branches of criminology. Um, and I mean, compared to what was happening during the Soviet times, particularly 60s and early 70s, because in the late 70s, already some Western ideas managed to find a little bit managed to find their way in the Soviet criminology. But this really looked like a revolution. But this revolution was very strongly opposed by the Moscow criminologists. And at different conferences, there were many fights among uh, representatives of St. Petersburg and representatives of Moscow and some other regions of Russia that would argue that St. Pete's criminology is not real criminology and only um, criminology that is grounded in this very strong uh, Soviet tradition. And Soviet criminology was seen as a very strong field. Only this, um, can be called truly the criminology. So what is happening uh, with criminology currently? It still remains as a part of the legal curriculum because originally it was it introduced in the 60s uh, as a part of the um, uh, law departments. It was taught at the law departments along with the uh, criminal law, corrections law, uh, criminal procedure. Uh, there was some influence from the Western institutions, some foundations that came to Russia and who sponsored a lot of social science research in the 90s and until 
maybe 2005, 2006. In criminology, it was less prominent than in other social sciences. The work, particularly like Saratov Center, was funded up to some extent by some uh, international foundations. Um, but also, I can think of Max Planck Institute that sponsored some Russian criminologists uh, in the 90s and in the uh, and, and later on who would come to Germany and people would bring suitcases of books from Germany to Russia. And um, in that sense, like I was lucky to study criminology in St. Petersburg because the professors who taught criminology to me, they, they did go to Max Planck, they would bring those suitcases of books and at least they would teach uh, Western theories of crime and they would not just limit themselves to the um, Soviet kind of uh, scholarships, uh, scholarship. But uh, there were no programs in criminology and until now there are no programs in criminology or criminal justice. All of this is a part of the criminal law corrections and criminology uh, departments. So you cannot get degree in criminology alone. It has to be coupled with um, criminal law and criminal law would be like a big brother. Criminology would be a smaller brother to that. Uh, and if you look at the number of dissertations that were defended um, after the breakdown of the Soviet Union, there were, actually there are many dissertations and I did not count after 2013, but even if you look at the list of the dissertations, there are many, maybe each 10th uh, defended dissertation will be like a purely criminological one, but also in the criminal law dissertations, you would find something like um, homicide, criminal legal and criminological aspects. So that would be a very common title for a, a dissertation that would have some criminological material in it. And we have a big Russian criminological association. Now in 2021, it was named after Azalia Dolgova, who was the leader of this association and who is one of the most, probably the most famous, famous Russian criminologist. They boast on the website that they have 1300 members, but when you look at the annual meetings, probably they attract around 150 to 200 active participants. But um, if you look institutionally, each law school, and there are many, there are law schools at almost every university, and each law school offers a course in criminology, and somebody has to teach this course. So there are many people around the country who are familiar with the criminological uh, topics and um, theories. How criminologists themselves um, see the contemporary state of uh, criminology in Russia? Well, first the quote uh, by Dalgova, whom I already mentioned, she was complaining that criminology in the country is again being consigned to oblivion as an independent science and the teaching discipline. And the question of its revival is once again on the agenda. Once again, meaning that it was consigned to oblivion in the 30s. And now once again, the situation is really in crisis. And this coincided with the times when criminology was excluded uh, from the curriculum for law departments as a mandatory discipline. It still remained as, a, as an elective course, but it was no longer mandatory. They brought it back as a mandatory probably around 2018. And also there were uh, professors who were complaining that criminology is in crisis, it's frozen, trivial, stagnant. And the last quote I like uh, in particular uh, by Professor Kvashes, who was saying that contemporary Russian criminology is moving from lethargy to liturgy, meaning it's like close to being buried um, in his view. Uh, so what are the theoretical contributions of the contemporary Russian criminology? Well, we can talk about this spectacular ideological disorientation of the uh, Soviet, uh, post-Soviet social sciences in general. And we can say that all the existing theoretical schools collapsed after the breakdown of the uh, Soviet Union, but somehow Russian criminology was 
perhaps the least affected out of all social sciences. Again, it's not considered to be a social science here, it's a legal science. Uh, and um, it is still, I would argue, still grounded in the Soviet theory. However, if during the Soviet times, there was some engagement with this dialectical materialism ideas, and there was some development of those ideas. However, in the post-Soviet times, I feel that people are just uncritically taking the Soviet textbooks, the Soviet theories, they're taking the concepts without really understanding where they do originate from. It doesn't look like they looked into the original works of Marx or any critics of Marxism or neo-Marxists, post-Marxists. It doesn't look like they're aware of the development of the Marxian tradition in philosophy and in, so and in social sciences, but they more look at those um, templates that Soviet and post-Soviet textbooks that have copied all these like templates at how you should be looking at crime. So new coming researchers just adopt those mm, lenses and they look at crime through those lenses. So if you look at the dissertations, almost in every dis dissertation, you would find something about social contradictions. And also you would find something about dialectical materialism. Later on, I will show you some examples from the most recent dissertations. And also another um, problem, which is common, not just for criminology, but for social sciences in general. Again, social sciences in, in Russia are not monolithic. When I say social sciences, I do not mean everything, not all political science, not all sociology is like that, but that would be more like a general trend when it comes to the um, academic uh, institution, mainstream academic institutions in Russia. So theories are viewed not as um, toolboxes for testing them, doing empirical research, but theories are treated again in this Marxian way, like the all encompassing worldview. So it has to be not just theories of crime, but it has to be the theory of crime. There has to be one theory of crime that explains all crime under all conditions. And every criminologist here is hoping to write a chapter, big chapter in a textbook. Well, it's better if he writes a textbook and it would be a chapter on crime causation. And this chapter would, would have this theory of crime. Uh, and unfortunately, empirical research is, um, I would say, almost non-existent. It's um, limited to examining uh, just the official crime rates and crime rates, they are published official crime rates. But again, there is a big question to what extent we can um, trust in the accuracy of the official data on crime. And also sometimes you would see uh, survey data that would be drawn from some small convenient samples of citizens. Sometimes it is citizens, sometimes those would be samples of law enforcement agents uh, who would share their views whether a particular type of crime is growing, how lat latent is a particular kind of crime. So what are the factors that are driving a certain crime into being. So this would be the kind of empirical research. Although empirical research is present in almost every dissertation, but it is not like at the core of the dissertation. It's more like some illustration that allows the reader to get the context of a particular study, or it's just the ritualistic thing kind of, you have to have some empirical Mm, part of the dissertation project. So you just gather the data. You're not really thinking how it's related to any theory. Mm, so, but even that is made on a very like a small scale. Uh, yeah, so here are the cases, how this dialectical method manifests uh, itself in the dissertations. So you can see these are dissertations from 2020, 2021, 2022 even. So you can see like what is the object of study. So you can see the dialectical interaction. 
people are writing dissertations still about the self-determination of crime. And almost every dissertation, you take any dissertation in criminal law and, uh, or criminology, I would say 70 to 80% that in the method section, they would say that the methodology is based in, is grounded in materialistic dialectics or dialectical method of cognition dialectical method of scientific cognition. So in each dissertation, you will read this. If you ask people, what, do, what exactly do you mean by that? They will not be able to answer this question. But again, ritualistically, they would insert this into their uh, dissertations uh, and books. Uh, also what happened after that uh, revolution, peripheral rev revolution, then of course a conservative turn happened as always after the revolution. And uh, we probably see more, uh, not uh, globalization trends in social sciences, but more um, localist trends, not just in criminology, but in sociology and political science. And Russia is mostly viewed as some exceptional case, like very specific, that requires some unique non-Western approaches to analysis. And the question is that nobody really defines what does it mean to be Western? Like what is a Western approach? And I would say not too many people are even, even, are even aware of mm, too many Western theories or of the ways how research is being done outside of Russia. Uh, and um, interestingly, there was uh, some empirical research about the uh, localism in sociology. And um, it was shown that this appeal of uh, localism is felt by those who uh, share this conservative ideology, conservative ideological positions, those who favor a mighty Russia that has to follow its own path, who is not afraid to challenge the West. So people who share those ideological beliefs, they would also share the ideas that sociology should remain local and not global. So in criminology, uh, again, some like examples of this conservative uh, turn of this uh, or of this uh, localism um, tendencies. Let's say uh, the most recent meeting of the Russian Society of Criminology that happened in summer of 2021. In the call for papers, one of the themes was the dangers of theoretical diversity. Again, I'm not sure whether this uh, refers to the dangers that are coming from the West, like is it Western theoretical diversity that people are afraid of, or they're afraid of the theoretical diversity that comes from those peripheral revolutions and that they still see as kind of being a big challenge for the mainstream post-Soviet criminology. Difficult to say that, but at least people believe that criminology should be monolithic. It should have the, the theory of uh, crime. Also, there was a movement that called for the development of indigenous science. And interestingly, again, it came from St. Petersburg. So this revolution ended with a reaction with a conservative uh, turn because Professor Shestakov, who considered himself very progressive criminologist in the 90s, around 2005, 2006, he began developing his own vocabulary for criminology that included Slavic words instead of the uh, Latin words to describe crimes. So he was saying that we should not even uh, include the vocabulary of the Western criminology in the Russian criminological vocabulary. Uh, and also he, he was promoting a lot the establishment of this local Neva Volga School of Criminology and he uh, still believes that it's, um, it's a school that can be uh, um, uh, it can compete with any Western uh, school of criminology. So kind of like a Chicago school, there is Neva Volga school of uh, criminology. And uh, it attracts a community of scholars that share uh, similar theoretical views who are, let's say like reading Shostakov and who are trying to work um, 
to develop like his ideas. And they still oppose themselves to this monolithic all Russian criminology. Um, but also one of the other problems is that there is a really lack of institutional support for any serious empirical research for any um, theoretical development, uh, but mostly for empirical research because people who are in criminal law and criminology field, they believe that empirical studies, it's not really criminology, it is sociology. And if you want to do sociology, you should go to the sociology department and do sociology there. And uh, you should not mingle with uh, like criminology people, with the real criminology people. Uh, so we can um, probably definitely say that the westernization project, if there was a project, probably there was no defined project of westernization of the Russian criminology, but all attempts to westernize, they failed. Um, until recently, the government was pushing scholars to publish in the um, journals that were indexed in Web of Science and Scopus because the Russian government was really aiming at bringing Russian universities uh, to higher positions in the global rankings. And all these publications, they were uh, rewarded and scholars were complaining a lot about it because they were feeling that they are being pushed into uh, publishing in the West without being supplied with the, all the necessary resources to do the empirical research uh, training, uh, training in English. Uh, so they were met with a lot of resistance, those initiatives of the government. So government is pushing, uh, criminologists are resisting, and criminology was really hoping to stay quite local. And it does see itself as very self-sufficient. So if you take a textbook, criminology textbooks are usually quite thick. And so that's one example, very popular Moscow, uh, 800 pages textbook, six pages about foreign criminology. The rest is like about the theory of crime and, and some other ideas that are being brought from the Soviet textbooks. But nobody is aware, if you ask a criminologist uh, if they can name foreign criminologists, maybe they would point at Durkheim, Merton, uh, maybe Lombroza and Beccaria, but uh, that would be probably about it. Uh, there is a lot of interest in foreign crime control policies, but again, if people do study uh, foreign crime control, usually um, it's not comparative research, it's usually just a description or uh, those would be some anecdotal evidences, like, oh, look at this program that was implemented in Netherlands. And somebody would describe, like, would spend half a page describing this program. And this would, this may be included in some textbook. Uh, so, and this case would be portrayed as if, see how it's being done there. Maybe we should do something like that, but maybe we should not. There are no translations, and I mean, nobody knows English. Well, again, I wouldn't say nobody knows English, but people do not know English to the extent that would allow them to really engage with the scholarship in English. And if you do not know English, there have to be translations. And unfortunately, there are many translations of seminal works in sociology, in political science, but particularly sociology probably every major sociological work was translated in Russian. In criminology, nothing like that happened. Maybe two textbooks, some works by Niels Christie because he was a good friend of Professor Gilinski and Professor Gilinski promoted Niels Christie in Russia. Therefore, we have works by Niels Christie. And well, a few other works, but again, that's just you know like a, a drop in the ocean. Uh, so the references to foreign sources are minimal. You wouldn't find them. If you look at the typical uh, Russian paper in the Russian journal, or if you look at the Russian textbook, no uh, quotes, no references from the Western sources. And when it comes to East or South, I mean, it is even worse. Maybe there was one book translated in the um, Soviet times about criminology in Japan, but that would be about it. And uh, you may notice if you look at the list of people who participate in the uh, 
uh, in different societies of criminology, in the foreign societies, let's say European society of criminology, you wouldn't see Russian members there, maybe one, two, three people each year would attend, but no more than that. Um, also, there is lack of inter interdisciplinarity in the field. Uh, as I've said, it maintains very strong ties with criminal law and corrections law. And you can see this even in the way how the criminology textbooks are structured. As in the criminal law, you would see the general part of criminology with like the main definitions. What is crime? What is criminality? Uh, what causes crime? And then there would be a specific part that would deal with uh, particular crimes, uh, types of crimes that are outlined in the criminal code. Uh, also, um, again, because it's a part of the legal curriculum, there are no courses in advanced social science methods, and there is like nowhere criminologists uh, can get uh, any familiarity with the social science methods. Therefore, probably we see this uh, poor state of empirical research, a very limited cooperation with other fields like sociology and psychology or political science, um, because legal field always was kind of uh, separate and um, legal professionals would always look themselves as kind of being superior to sociologists or political scientists. Therefore, there was not much demand from the legal criminologists for this kind of cooperation. There are no economic incentives. Until recently, multidisciplinary programs and projects were not funded by the government that well. Even now they're not funded well, but at least you can apply for some state funded grants uh, for multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary projects. And also, uh, speaking of the criminological research that is being done, not inside the mainstream uh, criminological academic centers, but in some other places, there is some research happening in sociological centers, but again, they do not cooperate with academic criminologists. They just do it by themselves. They don't call it criminology. They don't call it criminal justice. One of the examples is the Institute for the Rule of Law at the European University at St. Petersburg. This is a very strong school in social sciences, the European University. And what they are doing, they do study police. They do study how the crime data is being produced by the law enforcement agencies. But they never call it criminal justice studies. They never call this criminology. They call this empirical legal studies. Um, I did some, a small um, project asking criminologists what they think about the state of criminology back in 2016. So you can see some responses of the uh, Russian criminology professors. Um, and you can see that um, they do believe that perhaps crime is caused by similar factors in all modern market economies. Again, this would be probably not, it does not contradict this Marxian theory of uh, crime, but at the same time, they do not think that foreign theories can adequately explain causes of crime in Russia. I mean, the, the percentage of those who believe that is smaller. Uh, also, half of them, more than half of them, do not believe that Russian criminology has well integrated. And I wonder who are those like 35% who believe that it has integrated into the world community. Uh, they see that the legislators and the practitioners um, uh, in the area of law enforcement, they do not really, they are not really interested in the criminological ideas. They do not take into account the opinion of the criminologists. And also I asked um, professors whether they believe that Russian criminologists ideas are relevant for the world criminology. And you can see that half of them believe that yes, it is relevant and half of them think that it's not really too relevant. So um, I'm almost done. So this is my last slide. So what are the future directions where would um, Russian criminology go from here? I guess um, there will be stronger localization trends 
in the academic institutions, I cannot see how uh, Russian criminology can get westernized in the next few years, at least. Uh, but at the same time, the government in the last years has been pushing for evidence-based policy. This was like a big thing. A uh, big thing was pushing um, Russian scholars and Russian universities into the world uh, university rankings, but also another uh, push is to produce uh, evidence-based uh, policy for, for those who are in charge. And so I would uh, envision that some centers, maybe not academic uh, institutions, but um, I don't know, maybe just some in independent centers will be established with government funding. They may get uh, funding for policy research. So this would be an area where something may be happening. Again, at this point, um, I don't know, maybe they will be affiliated with the law enforcement agencies, maybe more money will be geared towards law enforcement inst academic institutes in order to produce this evidence-based uh, policy. But again, kind of right now, everything is in flux, so it's difficult to say. Uh, so the good question, I guess, uh, what does it mean southernizing in the Russian case? Again, can we treat Russian criminology? Is it, is it Southern? Is it peripheral? Is it post-imperial or like how do you, how would you define it? Uh, should it northernize? Can it not northernize, westernize? And will it? Probably won't. But at the same time, if we're thinking about southernizing, should it southernize maybe? And maybe this would be if it's not looking towards the West, maybe it will be looking towards the East and maybe uh, there will be some new developments in, in this regard. So yes, thank you for your interest uh, in, in my talk. I, I hope I didn't bore you too much. So I guess I will stop sharing my screen.